Chapter 16 You owe me three weeks' worth of wages, said Wilbur grumpily as they rode away from the Mouse Kingdom a week later. They did not pay me. Hey, they owed me half a kingdom, said Harriet. It's not like I got paid either. I mean, I was going to give it back to the princesses, but it's the principal. All in all, it had seemed like a good idea to leave town as soon as the dust had settled. The twelve princesses were doing just fine. August was opening a florist shop, and March was apprenticed to a master chef. May had gone off to train as an assassin in the next county over, which had horrified Wilbur and delighted Harriet. January, it turned out, had been secretly engaged to one of the guards for over a year, and he had taken the youngest, Mice, to his mother's house. It was a very large house, with no bars on the windows or anywhere. January, as presumptive heir to the throne, had repealed the law about mandatory dance lessons to prevent future magical incidents. Harriet approved of this enormously. The Mouse King and Molzelda, the witch, might have had something to say about it, but they were spending their honeymoon repairing the castle. The towers falling had damaged part of the main castle, so they were rebuilding, organizing everything first by color and then alphabetically. Molzelda's underground cavern had survived the earthquake, and she was paying for the reconstruction effort with silver trees. It'll keep them occupied for years, Jim and I told Harriet a few days later. But uh, we're all going to find our own patch of dirt while they're busy, in case they get any ideas. He tugged on his snout. You might want to go too. Mom's in love with the Mouse King, but she's got a long memory. This was extremely good advice. Harriet took it to heart. She left a note with August to keep an eye on Molzelda. If the Mole Witch got the idea to power her spells using unwilling dancers again, well, August had promised to send word. Harriet nudged Wilbur. It was time to leave anyway. Hetty's egg will hatch soon. Besides, you got a battle core of your very own. That's got to be worth something. Hyacinth preened. Mumphrey made besotive quirky noises at her. It was nice of August to give her to me, Wilbur admitted. I suppose you don't have much time to ride quail when you're a florist. We didn't do so bad, said Harriet cheerfully. You got a quail, I saved my kingdom's future. Jim and I had also promised to take a look at the basement of Wilbur's castle but Harriet was keeping that as a surprise. They came over the rise and saw an ancient shrew sitting by the side of the road. Princess Harriet called the shrew waving. Harriet reined in the quail. Oh, it's you, she said. I wondered if you'd show up again. Indeed, said the shrew, fixing her with one bright eye. Indeed. The Mouse King didn't give you a reward, did he? Well, he let me leave the kingdom without throwing things at my head, said Harriet. Does that count? The shrew fairy snorted. No, but my kingdom's okay now, right? Not going to fall in a handful of generations, however long that is. Looks okay, said the shrew. I mean, it's still squishy, but it's a better sort of squishy. Well, that's a relief. The shrew nodded. We've taken the liberty of punishing Mozelda, she said. She probably hasn't noticed yet, but she won't be able to borrow anybody else's power ever again. If she tries, her fur will all fall off. Yeesh, said Harriet. Why didn't you do that before? Had to catch her in the act, said the shrew, shrugging. And it might have been a little tricky if she had all those dancers to call on magically. But never mind that. I have come to reward you, princess, for your valor in breaking the spell and freeing the mice and moles from bondage, and also to take back the poncho of invisibility. Oh, that. You lost the poncho of invisibility, didn't you, said the shrew. 
I had a lot on my mind, said Harriet. There were people yelling and battering rams and more yelling and things falling down. I think I did very well, considering. Those don't grow on trees, you know, said the shrew. We can't just hand them out like candy. Sorry, muttered Harriet. The shrew studied her for a minute, then her expression softened. Well, you did do very well, considering. A lot of other heroes wouldn't have done as well. I admit, pulling half the castle down was a little extreme. It was only a quarter of the castle, at most. But it taught the Mouse King a very good lesson, finished the shrew. So I'm giving you a gift, ah, said Harriet. The shrew beckoned. Harriet drew closer to the ancient fairy. Kneel, hero, intoned the shrew. The shrew reached out, tapped Harriet's crown, and said, I grant you a very limited charm. You can cliff dive again safely. Really, cried Harriet, cliff diving? She could have hugged the old fairy, but the shrew vanished in a puff of smoke that smelled like cupcakes. Harriet hopped up onto Mumfrey's back, grinning from ear to ear. She could cliff dive again. Nothing could ruin her mood, although Wilbur did try. I can't believe you lost the poncho, he said. Misplaced, and it's in the ruins somewhere, I think. I'm sure someone will find it eventually. How will they find it? It's invisible. The mouse king will probably find it and alphabetize it or something. Harriet waved her hand. Who cares? I can cliff dive again. Mumfrey set off chirping. They passed a small clump of blue flowers by the side of the road, which neither of them noticed. Thirty years later, August, by now the queen of Floris, would come by and collect the seeds. She would grow the seeds in her garden, and a handful of generation hence, Harriet's great-great-granddaughter would give them to a dragon in return for a very important favor. I see no way that could end horribly. That's the spirit. Now let's ride. But that's another story, and the future is always squishy. In this time and in this place, atop two very happy quail, Harriet and Wilbur ride away into the sunset and on to the next adventure.